Epilepsy is the commonest serious neurological condition worldwide. It affects all, uh, all strata of life. It affects uh, it's all countries and all, all strata of life. It's globally distributed, knowing no racial or geographic bar barriers. Um, despite great advances in the science behind uh, uh, epilepsy, uh, it remains a highly stigmatized condition. Um, and it remains a, a, a heavy burden to society. So I'm just going to sort of go through what, what is epilepsy. So epilepsy, is, are, they're due to excessive discharges in, in the brain leading to a discernible event. So there are many different types of epilepsy depending on what part of the brain the discharges originate. So it's an entirely clinical diagnosis. So people always talk about tests. And the tests are really to try to better define what type of epilepsy someone has. But the, ultimately, the diagnosis is all about um, is a clinical diagnosis. And really, there are four questions to, to ask someone with a paroxysmal episode of collapse. So as neurologists, we'll often be referred patients who will GPs will refer patients with, with an episode of collapse. And, and the questions that we ultimately need to ask, and all of them are important. The first question is, so is the collapse? The first question, is it a seizure? The second question, if it is a seizure, is it an epileptic seizure or another type of seizure, of which there are several? And the third question is, if these are indeed epileptic seizures, what type of epileptic seizures are there? And then the fourth question is, if, if you know what type of seizures there are, then what is the epilepsy syndrome? And as neurologists and as, epilept uh, as epileptologists, it is contingent on us to answer all four questions. Just saying to somebody that they have uh, epilepsy it simply isn't good enough. You do, people deserve better than just saying that you have epilepsy. So it doesn't give you any explanation of why the epilepsy is there or what type of epilepsy it is. And it takes many different forms. So it's important to characterize, to standardize, and to have correct communication. So we really, both as neurologists and, uh, and to the general public, we, there needs to be a common language, and a language that we all use, and that all understand. So the, the, the original diet classification really came from 1981, where seizures were classified into partial seizures or generalized seizures. And then the epilepsy syndromes were classified in 1989, but the and these are the most these two papers are the most highly cited, not surprisingly, papers in epilepsy. But the point about the classification, particularly the classification the 89, it didn't really. We have moved on from that, so it didn't really take into account the impact of imaging or the impact of genetics. And so there's been a new proposal for a classification of seizures in 2010. Which, <coughs> which remains somewhat controversial because I think it's, it's more aspirational rather than actually where we are at the moment. But if you look at seizures, so you could have generalized seizures, which generalized tonic-clonic seizures, which is what everyone thinks of when we talk about seizures. But there are other types, or absence seizures in children, or myoclonic seizures, atonic and tonic seizures. So it's atonic seizures where people lose tone and fall down, but may not necessarily lose consciousness. And tonic seizures where you go stiff, but you don't get the, the, the shaking component. And then the partial seizures, you can simply have an episode where you have uh, disruption of, so you may get a sensory symptom or a funny taste, or, but with no impairment of consciousness, going on to a, a, an episode with impairment in consciousness, which then may proceed to an episode where you lose, con you, you lose consciousness and have a generalized seizure. And, but if you, look at, if you look at 100 people with seizures, probably somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, you won't be able to accurately classify them between partial or generalized. And that often is because people may have, they may have a small number of events, or they may have just nocturnal events, and you can't really determine. So if you think about uh, generalized seizures, basically where you have um, bilateral uh, involvement of both halves of the brain, whereas a focal seizure uh, involves, is located to one distinct part of one hemisphere of the brain. And th the point about the focal seizure is how deep the seizure will be very much depends on how much 
it spreads. So for example, if it's localized just to one small area, you may have an episode without uh, impairment of consciousness. So for example, uh, somebody with temporal lobe epilepsy may have just uh, a funny sensation of deja vu, or they may have a, a funny um, uh, taste in their mouth, or they may have uh, uh, the hearing, they may get some hearing uh, hallucinations. But but if that spreads, then you may have an episode where you have impairment of consciousness, where you become unaware, you may have uh, automatisms, and then if that spreads further to, to both sides of the brain, then you may have a secondary generalized seizure. So the point about generalized seizures, they're not, uh, they, they, do, they do focally, uh, they, they are focal in onset, but they spread rapidly. Um, and they're involved bilaterally across the network. So involving both the cortex and subcortex. And the other thing about, about uh, generalized seizures is actually, on close observation, they can appear asymmetrical. So focal seizures, on the other hand, they tend to be limited to one hemisphere, um, but, would, but may become more uh, widely distributed. So the generalized seizures are the tonic, clonic, tonic-clonic, absence, myoclonic, uh, and the, f the simple, the focal seizures are your simple seizures or your complex seizures, so with, impair with or without impairment of consciousness and secondary generalized. So an absence seizure, so absence seizures account for about, they're a very specific type of seizure and they account for about 10% of childhood soon. And this is very much a childhood, uh, it's a childhood syndrome. So they often will, a blank stare, loss of consciousness, they'll stop moving, there may be eye blinking or eye rolling with minor tongue. They sudden onset with rapid recovery and they may have brief but many attacks per day. And usually this occurs in the context of one of the genetic epilepsies, idiopathic generalized epilepsy, and has a very classic uh, appearance on the EEG. The point about these seizures are they often will occur in the context of other seizures. So children with these or adolescents with these type of seizures will often have uh, also have generalized seizures are myoclonus. Um, but for people, for children with pure uh, juvenile absence epilepsy or childhood absence epilepsy, the majority will go into remission by the time they, they reach adulthood. And so really it tends to be this, this is the classical staring episode. Um, maybe they may have some eyelid uh, fluttering or movement of them out, but they, you know, it will last for a couple of seconds and they'll be unaware. So the generalized tonic-clonic seizure is, is this the classical seizure. So the loss of consciousness and awareness may have an, a, a cry beforehand, will often fall or injure themselves. And this is the seizures that we worry about the most in, in the context of injury. So the tonic phase is where, where you go, where the, the body goes stiff, and the clonic phase is usually then when, which is rapidly followed by the clonic phase, is where you get the, the shaking, often associated with tongue biting or incontinence a sudden onset with gradual recovery. But the actual period of the seizure itself typically is actually quite brief. So the normal seizure, a normal generalized seizure lasts between one and two minutes. Um, but often associated with confusion, sleep, headache, uh, muscle pain. <coughs> and this is sort of the classic picture. So usually, often actually, the seizure itself is quite short, but the, the, the period for recovery can be quite long. So myoclonic jerks usually are, occur in the context of other types of epilepsy. So they're usually brief. Uh, they can be singular cluster. So literally a very rapid uh, jerking movement of the shoulder or the arm. So literally, often if you're holding something, it'll happen. Uh, you, you may drop it. And it's classically con in the context of, again, idiopathic generalized epilepsy or particularly uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And literally, it's something that lasts a couple of seconds. We know that it's localized to chromosome 6, but, but, but the, the exact genetics have yet to be determined. And so going on to the partial seizures, so the simple partial seizures are the most basic or elemental seizures. And this is where you get uh, an alteration in sensation, or you may get some some focal movement of the arm, but the clear point is that this is very localized to one part of the brain, um, and there is no impairment of consciousness. 
So if it comes from the temporal lobe, which is the majority of partial seizures arise from the temporal lobe, you may get a sense of deja vu, uh, fear, auditory, or, or, or an abnormal sense of smell. For frontal lobe seizures, it's less clear, so the, the semiology or the appearance of the seizures are less consistent, but then usually motor or sensory beforehand. And then parietal seizures, which really are probably no more than 5% of epilepsy, it's often a sensory or sensation of vertigo. And then occipital lobe seizures tend to be visual hallucinations, so usually uh, color circles or dots or distortion of, of size. And it's very much, a simple partial seizure is very much dependent on what part of the brain is involved. So the complex partial seizure is a seizure, typically they're longer, they, you've got impairment of consciousness, often with associated confusion afterwards, and they last typically for temporal lobe epilepsy two to four minutes. For frontal lobe epilepsy, they're much shorter, they tend to be much more uh, dynamic from a, a movement point of view, and they tend to cluster. So, for example, just to give an example, so a 48-year-old electrician was seen in clinic Sensation of deja vu, odd smells since childhood, looked back during a conversation with his, with his boss and was fiddling, uh, fiddled with his fingers and blew a kiss. And this is why he was referred. And very much this was in keeping with a diagnosis of temporal lobe epilepsy. So just going to complex partial seizures. So again, two to four minutes. Often we'll stop what they're doing, um, emotionless. Um, often um, we'll have movement of the opposite hand or, or movement of the hand the, on the same side. There may be facial oral uh, movement. They can, you may continue uh, with simple text but not complex text. And speech may be retained or you may have speech disturbance. But classically uh, followed by periods of confusion. Uh, frontal lobe seizures tend to be uh, much briefer. They often occur at night and they tend to cluster sudden onset with cessation, so typically no warning, um, and often bilateral movements, so sort of cycling um, movements of the legs or hands, head rotation, um, and often these will become secondary generalized. So this process is where you go from sort of one part of the brain to both sides of the brain and then to generalize, and that's sort of the, in a sense, uh, uh, an epileptic discharge progression. And so there are other types of partial seizures. Um, as I said, parietal seizures are very rare. Um, but the uh, occipital seizures, I suppose they are where the, the thing is sort of very basic visual hallucinations, not complex hallucinations. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go through the causes. So syndromes, the epilepsy syndromes, they're defined by age, seizure type, seizure frequency, um, family history, imaging. So the, like everything, the localization can be par idiopathic, they can be cryptogenic or symptomatic. So the idiopathic tend to be what we refer to as a genetic, uh, the genetic um, uh, epilepsies. And interestingly, the symptomatic, when people talk about brain imaging, you're always looking for symptomatic. So something, uh, a focal thing to describe why the seizures may be arising. If you think about seizures, you can sort of, the, you can almost divide them into four quadrants by age and by, uh, by type. Um, and the classic idiopathic generalized seizure in childhood is the childhood absence. And the classic uh, uh, fo focal epilepsy in adults is, is temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis or scarring. So the new classification, which is in 2010, has changed this. And I've said I'm going to... So the idea of this is, is, is more to use, uh, particularly there's been a focus on using uh, genetics and metabolic. Uh, so the main classifications now by etiology are genetic, structural, or unknown. Um, the problem is, as with everything, with all classifications, there's overlap. Um, and the problem is actually, in, in a sense, the, the classification it, it, it is quite aspirational in that sense. It's, it's, it's applying a level of complexity to our knowledge of, of epilepsy that as yet we do not have. 
So really, the, if you look at the original classification, how we think of epilepsy, we would all sort of thought very much it was a dichotomy between, and a clinical dichotomy between focal and generalized epilepsies. Now the 2010 classification is very much, it, it adds a biological class uh, component to that, so the impact of genes and, stru and structural abnormalities and mechanisms. And so d d as an example, you have, if you have take temporal lobe, there is a, there is a syndrome called uh, um, GEFS plus, which is generalized epilepsy with febrile seizures. And that's known to have a genetic basis, so it, it's known to, have, to be related to disruption of a channel. Yet we know that you've got two different types of epilepsy, yet with a, with a, a similar underlying biological mechanism. So, so ultimately, the classification of how we view cl uh, epilepsy is very much a wo work in progress. Um, this is, I suppose, so talking about risk, I just want to move on from classification to basically look at the, the epidemiology of epilepsy and its impact on, on health care. So overall, as there, if you look at the epidemiology of epilepsy worldwide, there is, there is a, a very significant variation both within countries and between countries. If you look at epilepsy worldwide, over 80% of people with epilepsy are in resource poor countries, typically from rural areas, mostly poor. And this, this is the global challenge, particularly with, that the WHO is facing, that the majority of people in epilepsy, that have epilepsy in the world, are in a situation that they have limited access to treatment and, um, and therapy. Um, and very much in the developing world, you've got a higher birth rate related to higher birth rate, higher infant mortality, which is, uh, is improving, um, shorter life expectancy, and it's mostly in the developing world, epilepsy is mostly a condition of young people, whereas actually the demographics in, in the developed world has shifted that it's less and less a, uh, a condition of childhood, but more actually, it's more the, the most common age group that are now diagnosed with epilepsy are the over 60s. Um, when you're comparing um, um, uh, findings between countries, it is difficult because there's a definitions employed are, 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 are different in cross country, and there's always this question of, of accuracy, the accuracy of the diagnosis because it's a, ultimately it's a clinical diagnosis, and because there's no physical substrate to epilepsy, uh, it does mean that the the, the diagnosis is. Uh, can be difficult. Um, also, the different there's difference in, in the use uses of classification and co causes of epilepsy or risk factors differ between countries. So overall, approximately the incidence of epilepsy, so the number of new cases of, of people who develop epilepsy per year, is approximately uh, approximately 50 per hundred thousand. Um, in, in resource poor countries, the, the, the range is much greater. It's somewhere between 80 and 190. And very much, um, on average, probably 120. This is particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, South, uh, and, and South America. In, certainly in Southeast Asia, the, the incidence appears to be similar to that of, uh, this, that of Western countries. But the main reasons why more people have developed epilepsy in resource poor countries are uh, CNS infections, so social factors, particularly poor sanitation, um, particularly uh, um, poor access to clean water, malnutrition, inadequate healthcare delivery systems. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, prevalence studies. The prevalence basically is the number of people with a condition at a particular time. And there's, there's data now from over 30 countries, including Ireland, interestingly. So the, the data for the prevalence of epilepsy in Ireland was published uh, in 2010 and very much confirms, is very much in keeping with the picture from uh, uh, Europe and the United States. But there is certainly wide variation across worldwide. And usually, 
a subset of the prevalence of epilepsy is actually really looking at the pe number of people with active epilepsy and that's so typically people who have had seizures in the last five years and that's generally the, 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 the prevalence of active epilepsy is somewhere between 0.5 and 1% of the population so it is not an inconsiderate uh, um, uh, uh, issue for, for healthcare systems. Um, it's usually higher in rural areas um, um, but there, and there have been reports that epilepsy is more common in particular uh, geographic areas. But the reason why th this is important is we also know that, that epilepsy is associated with a higher rate of mortality than one would expect for the general population. There's circumstantial evidence that this is higher, even, even higher in some uh, uh, of the poorer countries. And this is a graph, this was a study from China that was looking at people with newly diagnosed epilepsy. And essentially this, basically, the, an SMR is the expected mortality if you compare the, uh, an age and gender matched population uh, to the population under study, the, it's, a, it's a ratio and the normal ratio would be one. So anything above one is a higher than you would expect. But so you can see the levels, but this is young people. So you can see from up to 14 there is no change. But suddenly when you go from 15 to 19, these were males, that the, the mortality was over, for those between the ages of 20 to 24, the mortality was, was 40 times higher than what you would have expected for, um, for people of the same age without epilepsy. And this, this study very much um, made the... Uh, Chinese government or Department of Health stand up and take notice. So there's now been quite a lot of move in conjunction with the, the WHO and the IBE to actually um, um, promote programs uh, and to promote treatment of epilepsy. Um, there is also evidence that for some people their, their epilepsy is very much on a spectrum and there, are, there, are, there is evidence for some people that seizures will stop, may stop without treatment. Obviously, there are no, in the Western world, this is the studies like that are just not possible, but there, are, there is evidence from, from uh, developing worlds that actually people, uh, maybe 20 to 30% of people with epilepsy will go into spontaneous remission. So obviously, if you look at prognosis, I mean, and the, I think the key point is this, this, the risk that epilepsy does pose. In a truly chronic condition which never recovers, the number of people who have ever developed the condition will be somber, similar to the number of people with current epilepsy. But in developed countries, um, the difference between the two rates is largely attributed to the cessation of seizures induced by, by treatment. However, in the developed world, in some countries, of, of over 80% of people with epilepsy do not have access to adequate treatment. And when you put that in context, so there are currently um, 22 different anti-epileptic drugs. The oldest of the currently used drugs, phenobarbital, has been around for over a century. So it was been in use since 1912. And the cost of phenobarbital per month is, um, I think, 10p? It's something like that. Yet, for most countries, they don't have access to it. And it's, bec it's because it doesn't it's of no benefit for the companies to produce it. So phenobarbital is recognized as, uh, and has been advocated by the WHO as, as, one, of the, as one of the key uh, treatments for epilepsy. But in many countries, um, the, the cost of the drug is far in excess of what it would be in the Western world because of distribution issues. So looking at this, this slower slide is looking at three di different areas. So in Pakistan, it looked at a population of 450,000, um, and of whom it was estimated that the uh, sort of the estimated 450,000 people with epilepsy, of whom 22,000 were on treatment. So essentially, the treatment gap was almost 95%. Similarly, in the Philippines, only 14,000 of 270,000 were on treatment, <coughs> and in Ecuador, uh, only 11,000 to 55,000. And interestingly, and this is the most recent of the studies, in Georgia, the incidence of epilepsy, the prevalence of epilepsy was estimated to be 11.4 per thousand, meaning that 
just under 70% of people with epilepsy were inadequately treated. And if you actually, if you, if you think about Georgia is an, is an interesting example. So in the, in the former Soviet Union, all of the, the, the former Soviet states had their, uh, had their specialized, the medical specialties uh, tended to, to be focused in different states. And interestingly, uh, Georgia was where neurology was based. So it's not actually from a shortage of neurologists. The number of neurologists uh, compares quite favorably to Ireland. Yet the access to treatment, either through social issues, so people, uh, fear of stigmatization, uh, people were not being treated. And this study was only, this was done from 2012. So if you look at prognosis, so there was always this condition, and certainly the, the early neurologists from Queen Square in the, in the 19th century and early 20th century were very much, a, a, it was very much a belief that if you didn't treat epilepsy, that epilepsy would get worse, and it was a progressive condition. That has, com has completely been disproved. We now know that irrespective for how long somebody is having seizures, if you put them on seizures, they, if you put them on treatment, their response rate is comparable to somebody that has a new diet that's only had one or two seizures. And this has been shown in a number of studies throughout uh, the developing world. So studies from Kenya, um, uh, Kenya, Ecuador, and uh, India. So irrespective of, and the drugs that were being used in these studies are, are the old drugs, so phenobarbital, carbonazepine, and phenytoin. And that, if you globally look at the distribution of drugs that people have access to, these are the drugs that people have access to. They don't have access to the newer fancy drugs, levotracetam, zanisamide. These are not drugs that the majority of people of epilepsy have, up, have access to. So overall, I think the, the thing to understand with epilepsy, the prognosis for epilepsy with, with treatment is, 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 is good. And I think it's been, in, in, if, in, so it's often said that 30 to 40% of people will have refractory epilepsy between uh, if you continue, if you don't treat. I think that's not true. I think it's overly pessimistic. I think the figure is much better. Um, and that's been shown with, 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 with longitudinal studies of people with epilepsy that actually the longer you follow people up, the greater the proportion of people go into remission. But there is definitely, uh, on one side, whilst for some people the seizures do spot, stop spontaneously, there is the question that, that epilepsy is, it is not a benign condition and for some people it can. Uh, there is associated mortality both as a direct or indirect consequence. Just looking at risk factors for epilepsy, so infection, head injury. But the reason why people develop epilepsy, it's not just one condition. There's often a single, there's often a, a, a primary precipitating event. So for example, somebody with a stroke, but actually why people develop epilepsy is multifactorial. Um, there are other, other reasons. <coughs> So, but the reasons, if you look at it globally, the, re the main reasons why people develop epilepsy, so in, in really as a global level, it's, it's very much poor sanitation, malnutrition, inadequate health care systems, also genetic factors. So family history of epilepsy enhances uh, the risk of epilepsy. Um, and just looking at specific causes, so viral encephalitis is a 16-fold increased risk of epilepsy. Bacterial meningitis, fourfold. Cerebral malaria, uh, fourfold. So you can see, in, certainly uh, as a global level, infections are the most common cause of epilepsy. And the most common cause globally of epilepsy worldwide is a condition called neurocystopsychosis, or Toxoplasma gondii, which we don't have here. But it, globally, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, it's the, it's the main cause of epilepsy. So from the point of view of understanding epilepsy, and I suppose I, look at the, I would look at this from, from an epidemiological point of view, we need to have further longitudinal epilep uh, epilepsy studies to understand what the natural history of epilepsy is and the impact of mortality. And really to understand uh, risk factors and attributable risk, we really need uh, case control studies. And I'm just going to finish on stigma. So the stigma is a social pro stigma is defined as a social process or rel related personal experience characterized by exclusion, rejection, blame, or devaluation. 
resulting from experience or anticipation of adverse social judgment about a person or group identified with a health problem. And stigmatization often causes much or even more uh, uh, suffering than the physical manifestations and effect of the condition. And the effects of, say, the social occlusion, so worldwide, children being barred from school, adults being barred from, from marriage. So, for example, in India, if someone had epilepsy, they were not allowed to marry until 1980. Uh, Problems with unemployment, so unemployment even when de even denied, even when seizures would not render people work unsuitable or unsafe. And this is often, ironically, often the most um, inconsiderate or, or poorly understanding of people in the healthcare system. So people often will, oh well you can't work because you might have a seizure. Um, and it, you know, I think, I think healthcare professionals in, in general um, Understand ep the, uh, the understanding of epilepsy is very poor and it's very much contingent on us to actually uh, improve people's understanding of epilepsy. So just looking at treatment models, there have been, there are different models that have been, uh, the WHO global uh, campaign, so epilepsy, epilepsy has very been very much a priority for the WHO in the past 10 years and the, that has resulted in a lot of WHO projects. Uh, to increase access to treatment, in particularly in China, Senegal, Brazil, and Georgia. So overall, looking at treatment in general, there's no black box approach. You need to, so if you're looking at treatment in, 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 in the developed world, there's no black box approach. It has to involve the local communities, and it has to be, uh, it, it has to involve and be respective of the uh, local beliefs. And I think that the, the message, uh, and, uh, while this is something we've tended to forget in the, um, the Western world, because it's a drug that we don't really use outside of pediatrics, is that phenobarbital is very much, it is a safe drug used at correct doses, and it is efficient, and it's something, but it's important that we, globally, it's, it's important that, that we ensure access to treatment to, in resource poor countries. So my so sort of conclusions really, epilepsy is a major uh, public health problem worldwide. The majority of people with epilepsy are in poorer countries with uh, variable access to treatment. There are different causes and risk factors, so the, the, the epidemiology and the etiology of epilepsy in the developed world is very different to that in the developing world. And even today, it remains, uh, sadly, a highly stigmatized condition, particularly, again, um, for people where they're most affected. So worldwide cultural aspects of epilepsy are not fully understood. Um, Health-seeking strategies, particularly, again, in the developing world, are not fully understood. There's a huge diagnostic gap, so the amount of people that have epilepsy but have not been diagnosed. There's a huge treatment gap particularly, again, in, in, the, in, the, in the developing world. Um, and so there's a, lot that, that there's a lot for the epilepsy community to do. Thanks very much. <laughs>